We are live. We don't have any viewers yet, but we are live, and it is recorded. We will have viewers here soon. Should I start, or should we wait? Wait just a couple of minutes, and we will have more people in here. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us. We, uh, unfortunately, the live link that uh, was posted is not working. So we've had to switch to this temporarily. Um, technology only works great when it works great. So, uh, but for now we do have here uh, Lauren Williams with the McKinsey Scott Law Firm for our training on film the police, but know your rights. Um, Lauren is a um, wonderful person to do this for us, uh, and we thank her very much for doing so. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Lucas. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for the kind introduction. So, um, I'll be looking out in the chat for any questions. Feel free to jump in at any time. Um, oh, you know what? I might be, I don't know if the audio is being picked up. It is being picked up through our microphone. I should say that if you would like to join the Zoom meeting, we're at, uh, the easy link would be tinyurl.com forward slash IB No, I'm sorry, FEB 15 training. That's February short, it's FEB, 15 training. So it's uh, tinyurl.com, FEB, 15 training. And that'll bring you into the Zoom if you want to uh, join us there. Or you can keep watching here on uh, YouTube or on Facebook. And we will uh, check those chats too. I think we have Indigo and a couple of others on that chat. Um, I see Crofty is here. Thank you, Crofty. I appreciate you helping out. Um, so if anybody has any questions, Crofty will definitely get my attention and, um, I will give this training back over to Lauren again, go to, I'm sorry, tinyurl.com forward slash F E B one five training. All right. Oh, yes. All right, let me know if anyone has any trouble hearing. I'm going to keep my computer muted because I think there will be an echo if I have you know, both okay. going. Mm -hmm. um, so let me know. All right, let me just jump in here. Oh, I don't know that it's going to let me. Oh, here we go. Um, so, you know, since we don't have a, a ton of participants um, tonight in person, this, this part might be a little quick, but... Um, I wanted to hear a little bit about some goals um, that you all have as cop watchers, um, why cop watching is important to you. Um, I don't know if Indigo or Marcus want to weigh in on, on some of your answers to these. Well, for me, definitely cop watching is, um, it's been a goal of mine to be able to do it uh, ever since I've been mistreated by police since I've been a, a youngster. Um, not just being mistreated, but watching them mistreat other people uh, and knowing that rights are being violated because of the lack of knowledge for the people that are being violated. Or even when the knowledge exists for the people uh, that are being violated, they still get violated. You know, you, you can express the fact that you know your rights 
and that you, you know you're not breaking the law, but still be uh, violated. And so watching that over and over again, um, I never did like bullies, and, and I definitely don't like those. And so it sounds like um, you know the act of, of filming the cops is is in hopes of deterring some of those violations, documenting those violations, and um, and hoping to to bring some transparency to it. Is that is that what I'm hearing? A absolutely, and the transparency um, is lacking, obviously. Um, and then when we at least provide transparency, then we can follow up for some accountability. hopefully bring sort of a solid legal foundation um, to folks who are engaged in cop watching so that they can bring those forth into the field um, and do what they do um, and clarify some common misconceptions about the law. Um, we also want folks to be safe. Um, we know that these situations can escalate um, and we hope that, that folks stay safe and avoid detention and arrest. Um, and we're also here to answer questions, provide resources, um, I can send some some handouts that I've found that I I think are helpful to sort of just keep in your back pocket as well um, to Marcus for dissemination. So um, just a quick outline of, of where we're gonna head next. Um, I think it's important to know where your rights come from, um, what those rights are, and probably most importantly, what the limitations on those rights are, um, what the cops can and can't do. Um, a lot of this is probably pretty obvious. Um, the vast majority of, of uh, what we'll be talking about today are rights that come from the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. Um, the California Constitution has a similar provision. Um, and then there's some statutes that protect those rights and also allow for people to bring causes of action or, or um, claims against government entities in court for violations of rights. Um, and then there's um, court opinions, so what we call case law, that can kind of clarify um, the bounds of those rights and define those rights, and those are kind of helpful to go through. Um, what's important to also keep in mind, so Tim and I, we're attorneys in California. Um, we practice law in California. Um, you, you know, living in California, um, there are certain opinions and court cases that are more important than others. Um, an, an opinion that um, came out in Massachusetts, for example, has only so much bearing on what the law is in California. And so for, for a federal court, um, the California District Court opinions, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal, and the United States Supreme Court, um, those are the most important types of cases. And then for California, there's Superior Courts and Courts of Appeal, and then the California Supreme Court. And that's kind of what, the, what law governs um, in this jurisdiction. Um, and this chart's probably pretty hard to see, but um, the Ninth Circuit is made up of several states as well. Um, and so sometimes there will be cases you'll see that come out of Montana, for example, about a Montana statute. And that, again, keep in mind that that kind of case, talking about a specific statute might have limited bearing. Um, but Tim and I are always happy to talk. If a case comes out and you see it in the news, we can talk about what it means here um, as well. Um, but those are just some, some things to keep in mind as you um, think about these cases. So um, I, th I think this is a really helpful quote. Um, the First Amendment protects the right to photograph and record matters of public interest, and that does include reporting law enforcement officers engaged in the exercise of their official duties in public places. That is a direct quote from a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal opinion. And so what this means is it's very, very, very clear that the Ninth Circuit believes that, um, or has held rather, that there is a First Amendment right to record the police in public. Um, weirdly, the Supreme Court has actually never explicitly um, gone so far as to, to say that on that specific issue with respect to, to cop watching, to filming the, the, the police. But in California, um, it is very safe to say that that is the law. It's very much well established. Um, an important aspect, though, to pay attention to in that um, statement is, is that in public places, it's 
it's well established that you can film cops. Um, there's a difference between a public place and what's called a non-public place. Um, the reason why this is important is the government can lawfully restrict speech to a much, much greater extent in a non-public place. Um, and I know we're, we're going to focus on um, situations where, where folks are filming in public places because I know that that's what Cop Watch Imperial Beach is all about. Um, but I do think it's helpful to just keep in mind that there is a difference um, in case you know something comes up where you do want to film um, somewhere kind of out of the ordinary. So a public place is a sidewalk, a street, a park, a plaza. The best rule of thumb is anywhere really outdoors um, is probably safe. Um, but non-public places are, are places where it's not really traditional to have assemblies or, you know, forums for public communication. Um, a lot of times that means like private government property, so the interior of any government buildings. Um, but it can also be ports of entry, which oftentimes do have outdoor areas. Um, and so those are the types of places where folks need to be a little bit more careful um, about filming. Okay. So... Um, moving on to those limitations, um, there are really two kind of broad areas. The government can impose reasonable restrictions on um, filming the police. Um, the, also, folks who are filming the police may not interfere with a cop's ability to do their job. Um, and so turning to the first sort of broad exception, um, Cops can place reasonable restrictions. Um, the legal terminology is that they can place reasonable time, uh, place, and manner restrictions on First Amendment activities in public forums, as long as those restrictions are content neutral and they're narrowly tailored to serve a government, a significant government interest. And they also leave open alternative channels of communication. Do we have a question, Marcus? No. Okay. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. So breaking this down, um, restrictions have to be reasonable. That's kind of vague still, so we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, cops really can't discriminate in terms of the speech at issue, the content of that speech or the viewpoint. What that means when it comes to, to cop watchers is they can't arrest someone who they know is a cop watcher, but not someone from the public who's also standing there filming just because you know they don't like cop watchers. That would be um, a viewpoint-based restriction that they've imposed. Um, they've also got to tie their restrictions to significant government interests. They can't just tell somebody to move for no reason. Um, of course, you know we know that cops may not necessarily have a reason in mind and, and sometimes can come up with something later. Um, and so that's always a, a big risk as well. Um, it's kind of easy for them to say, oh, well, you know, some, this was happening and that was why. Um, and then cop watchers should be able to have other means of getting the same information. Um, and so it's easy to sort of think about these, these things in the extremes. A cop can ask someone to move from the street to a sidewalk so that a, a, a cruiser can drive by and you know that person might have almost exactly the same vantage point. They're still allowed to film. That's that's a pretty easy example of what a cop can do. Um, and then a good example of what a cop would not be able to do is, is kind of like I just mentioned. They can't ask a known cop watcher, but not others, other members of the public, to move so far away that they can't see. Um, and their only justification is that the cop doesn't like being filmed. <laughs> yeah. So um, moving into the, the case law examples, um, I think going through the cases is helpful for a couple of reasons. Um, it, it shows sort of from the court's perspective, um, you know, how these cases move through the courts, but also the limitations on the opinions themselves. It's easy to read a, a court opinion and think, oh, this gives me the green light to do X, Y, and Z. And that's often not exactly the case. It also is easy to read an opinion and, and, and come to the conclusion that, oh, the, the cop watcher or the, the plaintiff, the person who was arrested or um, had their rights violated, they won this case. Sometimes that's not the case. And so going through um, in a little bit more detail, some of these cases I think will be helpful. 
Um, and on that note, I want to take a little deep tour to talk about the life of a civil case in court. Um, so the complaint starts the lawsuit. So plaintiff cop watcher sues defendant cop. Um, but then there's this stage in the middle before a case ever gets to a jury trial um, where the defendant, the cop, can file motions asking the court to basically throw out the case and never let it get to the jury in the first place, okay? That is where a lot of the court opinions that um, we'll be talking about and that you hear about in the news and that you read about online, that is the stage that a lot of opinions come from. And often we don't even necessarily really know what happened at trial after that or if the case ever even got to trial, um, maybe it settled. And so, um, you know, keeping that in mind, um, let's move to this First Circuit case that I know um, we've talked about a little bit before, Marcus. Um, this is a case out of Massachusetts. So although the Ninth Circuit has similar um, opinions, and I think that it's a very persuasive case, it's not actually like a binding case in California um, because it's just, it's not our jurisdiction. Um, when we file appeals, they go to the Ninth Circuit. When somebody in Massachusetts files an appeal, it's going to go to the First Circuit. So it's a little bit different. But it is a helpful case. Um, the facts of this case are pretty straightforward. Simon Glick was walking through the Boston Common Park. Um, he was concerned that some cops were using excessive force, so he took out his cell phone and started filming. Um, and he was roughly 10 feet away. Um, the Court of Appeal... Um, easily was able to conclude that this is an easy case. He was clearly within his bounds exercising his First Amendment rights. Um, those rights were clearly established, which means that the cops were not entitled to qualified immunity. Um, where someone's rights are clearly established, the cops are on notice that if they violate those rights, they're going to be sued and they don't get qualified immunity. They're not immune from the lawsuit. Okay, and so basically the court just said the, the lawsuit can proceed against those cops. Um, and then it was sent back down to the lower court for further proceedings, for trial, for whatever. But the court made some comments in its analysis that are helpful. Um, they relied very heavily on the fact that this was a quintessential place of, you know, assembly of speech. It was the Boston Common, um, which is actually the oldest city park in the United States, I didn't know. Um, he was peacefully filming from a comfortable distance, um, which it, he did not interfere with the cops' performance of their duties. He neither spoke to nor molested the cops in any way. So they basically said, this is, what, this is an easy case. Um, and, you know, the right to film does have its limitations, but we're not going to get into them here because, you know, it's such an easy case, okay? So sometimes the implications of what the, what the court says in their opinions can tell us more than, you know, the conclusion. The conclusion seems pretty obvious, um, but the implications are, hey, you know, we're not necessarily going to find, um, you know, that the cops can't restrict someone from filming in every instance. Um, if they were interfering, if they were, you know, speaking to the cops, that could be different. And so that's, that's important to keep in mind. There is a, um, a YouTube viewer that has a question. Um, I think it's Michelle Pichet, but I'm not sure of the pronunciation. It might be Michael Pichet. I'm not real sure. Anyway, um, they would like to know, uh, if you were to just tell the person their rights, like say, don't let them search or don't give your ID, can that be called interfering? That's a very good question. And so I, if I'm understanding correctly, and correct me if, if I'm not, um, the question is, if you're a bystander and you see a cop interacting with someone else and telling them, um, you know, give me your ID or, or something of that nature, and you say, don't do it, you don't have to do that, is that interference? That is a very, very good question. And we, I actually have some um, slides on that okay. um, later in the PowerPoint. But that's kind of a gray area. Um, there are a couple of cases that come out a little bit differently on that issue. Um, there's one case where someone is, is telling some 
some bystanders, bystanders, but also some um, a suspect, um, basically not to comply with the cop's orders. And the court says that that did not rise to the level of obstruction, such that somebody could be arrested for obstructing under the misdemeanor statute 148, California Penal Code. Um, but insinuated that that may have been different if the person that was being arrested had actually followed that advice. Oh, if they had caused the person to actually resist and delayed, actually caused delay, then that may have been different. But what the court found was that the evidence showed that the, the man who was, who was resisting, the, the suspect, um, was already resisting before the person said, hey, like, don't let them take you or whatever they, whatever they said. Mm. Yeah. And so that's a little dicey. And, and as attorneys, our advice would be just be quiet. Just don't say anything because we don't know how the court is going to rule, especially when um, there are cases that kind of go both ways. Um, it's just so fact specific. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, but there, there are some cases that, that you know, are helpful in that area, and I would say probably more than than not. Um, but it's still it's, it's a little bit, it's a little tough. Okay, so, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so you know I don't want to go too too far into detail um, with these cases, but this one um, is just an example of um, you know I guess the pitfalls of taking too much from a case. So this case very much established in the Ninth Circuit that there is a First Amendment right to film cops. Um, this, this individual was filming a protest. Um, and the Court of Appeal just said, you know, there is a First Amendment right, but the jury is the one that decides the factual disputes. So there's evidence that this man was assaulted by a cop, um, but, you know, we're, that's not the end of the story. The Court of Appeal does not decide whether you win or lose on your claims. And so it was sent back. Um, for further proceedings. Okay, um, this one was interesting. Um, this this judge, um, the district court, dismissed this case very, very, very early on, before there was really any development of the facts. Um, border policy advocates had been filming um, and taking photos of of the port of entry, but they were standing on public areas, um, and the the government um, stopped them, destroyed their photographs, and they sued um, under the First Amendment. The Court of Appeals said that the government's justifications, which were just very broad, border security, protecting U.S. sovereignty, were, were just too broad, too thin. Um, they didn't hold any weight. They need to tie their reasons to more specific um, justifications. And, and so they sent it back um, to the lower court for further development of those facts. Um, and uh, that was, you know, that's all I really know about what happened with that case so far. Um, this one was kind of interesting. Um, so Reed was part of a nonprofit um, organization. He would observe buffalo herding operations into Yellowstone um, National Park. He was told to move. He had been parked in um, off of the highway on a gravel road. Parts of the highway had been blockaded, but he was off of that area um, and he wanted to record the herding operation. Um, the court below dismissed the case before even letting the, the claims go to the jury. Um, and he, he was so far away that he missed the entire herding operation. Um, and so he sued, saying that it was, um, of course, a, a violation of his First Amendment rights and that they didn't have a justification to make him move so far away that he couldn't see. And um, the, the, sorry, let me grab my notes because I'm trying to remember exactly the, the posture here and I don't have my, I don't think I'm able to see them while I'm on Zoom. Um, okay, yeah, so, so this, 
So the, the government's justifications were that he was in an unsafe area. The buffalo could have wandered all the way up and, and hurt him. There was evidence in the record that really undermined the yeah. idea that he was in danger. Yeah. And so uh, the court didn't really weigh the government's justifications very heavily. Um, there was also evidence that showed that folks in Yellowstone Park were allowed to see the herding operation from about 50 yards away. <laughs> Um, which, again, undermined the government's explanations really for why they made him move. Um, and so, ultimately, you know, the court, again, sent it back down um, to the lower court um, so that he could, he could move forward with his claims. Um, this is a good example of, um, like, a viewpoint, a non-neutral viewpoint restriction. Um, this individual was arrested after chalking anti-cop statements outside of the courthouse, but others who were also chalking, but not writing anti-cop statements um, were not arrested. And so um, it was clearly established that they had the right to write, you know, whatever their opinions were in chalk. The restriction was obviously viewpoint um, specific. Um, because of the disparity and who was arrested, and so there was no qualified immunity for those officers. Um, and I think we, we kind of went over the takeaways as I was going through the cases. The right to film is, is definitely robust. The limitations are pretty fact dependent, and a lot is up to the jury, which is important to keep in mind. Um, and there's no hard and fast rules, you know? Just because in the Glick case that person was 10 feet away doesn't mean that you can always film 10 feet away, okay? It's a good, you know, it's a good case um, to, to argue that it, that's a reasonable distance, but the cops, you know, can always say, well, this situation was different, you know, maybe somebody has a gun or there's some other dangerous aspect of um, the situation that they can point to. And so... That's why it, it's it's not a great idea to walk up to a, to a situation and say I have the right to stand ten feet away, um, and you know maybe not comply with the cops' orders um, to the contrary. And it's something that we can sort out in court. You know, if they don't have a justification, they don't have a justification. Um, but to stay safe, you know, our advice would be to be careful to to comply with. Um, even if they're illegal. Um, and then the same, same thing about tape, you know, caution tape is not necessarily required. Um, and I don't think that it would be a great position for us to take um, that, that it should be required because then you'd have issues where they're putting the tape up in, in larger areas than is necessary um, and restricting people's vantage points. So um, the second limitation is interference. And I know some of those cases sort of overlapped um, with this concept, but it's really, really important to try not to interfere or impede the cops' ability to do their jobs or even really toe that line for a couple of reasons. Um, first, if you, if you are found to be interfering or the court feels that you are interfering, um, in your, your lawsuit, it's gonna make it a lot harder to succeed on those First Amendment claims as well. Um, because the cop can say, well, you know, I placed this restriction on this person because they were doing X, Y, and Z that was hindering my ability to do my job. It just makes it a lot easier for them to tie um, their justifications to a, a legitimate government interest. Because any court is gonna say there's a legitimate significant government interest in a cop doing their job. Um, but the second one um, is that interfering with um, police can be a criminal offense. So um, Penal Code 148 and Penal Code 69 both um, criminalize obstructing officers. Um, 148 is a misdemeanor, 69 is a felony. Um, PC 69, um, it, it's very similar, it's essentially the same, but it also requires um, threat of violence or force um, or use of violence or force in um, resisting or obstructing an officer. 
those those um, statutes also have subsections, though, that explicitly state that merely taking a photo or merely um, videotaping or recording is not enough in and of itself to constitute a violation. And that's very, very helpful. The most important thing to keep in mind, though, is that anything more than that, the cops are going to latch on to, um, to try to say that, well, it wasn't just that, it was this too. So that's why it's important to know what it means to interfere, interfere, resist, delay, obstruct, because those, you know, otherwise are just w words, right? So case examples are kind of the best way to try to figure out um, where those begin and end. So here are some examples of conduct the courts have considered to be resisting, delaying, or obstructing running away um, and hiding while the cops are approaching. In that case, the cops had reasonable suspicion to think that some folks had stolen some jackets and they saw them looking at them in a trunk and then put them back. When they saw the cops coming, they ran. One of them hid under a table in someone's yard. And they said that that was, you know, they delayed the officers and that was enough to, to charge a 148. Um, pushing an officer while they're arresting someone else, um, refusing to provide a name during booking on a felony. It's not um, actually obstruction if you refuse to provide your name um, on a misdemeanor or an infraction. Not necessarily a great idea because it might escalate things, but it's technically not. Wow, we didn't, as a community, I don't think we knew that. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, if you're being booked on a felony, it's just the, the problem is it's, you know, in the moment it might not be very clear to someone whether they're being charged with a felony or a misdemeanor. And so again, to try to avoid escalation, it may be better. It's our advice, it'd be better to just give your name. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but there are some other considerations that other people might be um, concerned with, for example, if they don't have immigration status or if they have, are on probation or parole or something like that. And that's just going to be a personal decision that somebody's going to have to make in that moment to weigh those pros and cons. Um, but oftentimes, you know, if you're out in the world and a cop wants to, have, to know your name, it might get you out of that situation a lot faster and unscathed um, to just give your name um, or give your ID. So anyway, but for what it's worth. Um, and then, so physically struggling with a cop, um, refusing multiple orders to leave someone else's residence, refusing to comply with a pat down. Um, and then regarding speech, I think this, this quote is pretty helpful um, and it gets kind of recycled in, in, in California cases. When a person's words go beyond verbal criticism into the realm of interference with a law enforcement officer's performance of his or her duty, the First Amendment does not preclude criminal punishment for resisting, delaying, or obstructing an officer in violation of California law, okay? So this, this criminal statute um, is not at odds with uh, the First Amendment um, as long as it's applied as it's supposed to be, but again, it's a little bit gray. So here are some examples of speech that courts have considered to be within the realm of interference, okay? So going beyond the protections of the First Amendment and impeding officers. Um, even just arguing with an officer who is preventing people from entering a club, saying you can't stop me from going back in there. Um, one court said, this was a long time ago, but it's still good, good binding case law, um, that that was interference. Interrupting an officer during witness interviews. There are a couple of cases um, where courts have said that that was you know, delaying, obstructing, um, threatening violence, providing a false name, telling someone that a cop was undercover and to run away. So that was, you know, an example I know that um, someone had asked about that. And that's kind of the, the other case um, where it, the outcome was different. So, and that person did run away. And so um, they found that that was obstruction or, or delay or resisting. Um, attempting to dissuade a victim of child abuse from telling officers what happened was also found to be interference. Um, and then here are some examples of conduct that courts have not found to be obstructive. Uh, slowly complying with orders, 
Um, there are a few cases that say, you know, you don't have to be super excited about complying. Um, slowly complying or kind of grumbling about it um, is within your rights under the First Amendment. Um, disputing the legality of officers' actions, so same thing. Some verbal criticism or challenge, but that's the thing is, you know, again, where is that line? It's, it's so hard to know how a court will come out. Um, a bystander encouraging a suspect and a non-suspect non -suspect bystander is not to cooperate. This is the one that I discussed a little bit earlier. Um, refusing to give a name if arrested for a misdemeanor or a fraction, an infraction. Um, that's what I was talking about a little bit earlier too. Um, so again, courts can be inconsistent. So the rules of thumb um, as attorneys, you know, we want people to err on the side of caution just because we know from experience and from reading all of these different opinions that are sort of contradictory, um, even when the facts are a little bit similar, um, only film in public forums. Um, I would keep 10 plus feet of distance. Um, don't speak to the officers at all, let alone, you know, curse at them or whatever. Um, especially while cop watching, you know, I think there's a difference when, when folks are in a protest and you maybe want to express like no more qualified immunity or whatever it might be, Black, Black Lives Matter, like those kinds of protests, like the purpose of that speech or that protest is to, to convey those ideas. Whereas, you know, when we talked about our goals with respect to cop watching, it's to be a bystander who documents um, you know, the cops see that you're there and, and you hope that that's deterring them from uh, violating the rights of the people who they're already interacting with, right? And so it's a little bit different of a situation. Um, it's not exactly the, the venue for, um, for expressing how you feel about cops, right? And so I think it's important to keep those goals in mind because I know that a lot of folks have had really bad experiences with cops and it's a very emotional an emotionally charged situation just to even be around them. And so I think just keep your goals in mind um, and hopefully that, that can kind of help keep those situations from, from escalating. Um, go ahead. There are a handful of questions oh, whenever sorry, you're ready. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, if anybody online has more questions, um, I appreciate you, Crofty, for keeping track for me. Uh, Katie Kidman is a well-known uh, internet cop watcher, and she has the first question. Hold on a second. Can they arrest you on a public sidewalk and prohibit you from posting videos on YouTube? Before you answer that, it's kind of a loaded question uh, because that happened to her. Um, she was arrested, and um, I thought illegally, wrongfully, mm -hmm. she was convicted uh, of, I believe, obstruction. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong there, Katie. And the judge then sentenced her to forbid her from cop watching during her probation. Okay. And obviously, we're all offended by that. Yeah. Um, I hope she's still doing it anyway, but um, <laughs> um, that's not legal advice. That's my personal opinion. Um, I've, you know, limiting people's First Amendment right through court is, right. uh, to me, uh, just shocking. Yeah, that is that is shocking. Um, I have not, to be perfectly candid, researched that specific issue. I know that um, you know when folks are on probation or federal supervised release, um, the court can place some restrictions um, that wouldn't otherwise be allowed to be placed on on other folks. Um, that you know seems very unfair to me. Um, I think the way that someone would be able to fight that would be to to appeal that to a higher. Um, I don't know like what the whether it was state court or federal court, but whatever court of appeal, um, you know, on the grounds that it's a violation of our First Amendment rights. Um, I do know that, you know, restrictions that are imposed on people 
for probation or parole or supervised release need, need to be very narrowly tailored to a certain interest. Um, and it, I'm failing to see exactly how they justified that, but I, again, I don't have enough um, knowledge about the facts or the law in that specific area to really give a, a legal opinion on that. Uh, another watcher um, goes by the name of The Beach Cam. He's here in San Diego. He is a media person, I believe, um, and he does do cop watch as well. His question is the government, if, is it the government's job to say who is and who isn't media, i.e. Uh, police issued press credentials? You know, that, that issue is interesting with the difference between press and, and the public's rights. Um, the public should have access um, to essentially the same extent. I know there is um, a statute that states that, that press are allowed in, in certain like emergency areas when there's like a natural disaster. I am not well versed on um, the ins and outs of that specific law. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, those sorts of really nuanced issues, I don't know that we can really speak on. Um, what we can speak on is, is the law in California and the Ninth Circuit with respect to cop watching. Um, but in terms of who is deemed press or not press, I haven't really happened upon anything that, that answers that question very well. And, and who gets to decide that um, is a really niche issue. Yeah, I'm sorry. No problem. Um, got more questions? One second. Can the cops label you as anti-law enforcement officer automatically if you are recording them? And then he goes on to ask, one second. Not easy looking at this thing. Um, and then use that label to try to prove obstruction based on the cop watcher's identity. Hmm. Um, so, I think, I'm, I'm not sure, correct me if I'm not answering this in, in the way that, or if I'm not understanding the question correctly, but I think what, what you're asking is, can you be sort of singled out for being like a known cop watcher? Um, and I would say, no, cops should not be treating cop watchers any differently than other members of the public or members of the press for that matter. Um, everyone has First Amendment rights. Um, I also, I don't think that it would be fair or a strong argument for the government side to say just because somebody is using a cell phone to film the police, they are anti-cop. Um, but that argument would also really work against them because they shouldn't be treating people who they believe are anti-cop differently. Um, that would be a viewpoint, uh, a, a non-neutral viewpoint related restriction, um, which make it harder for them to justify, to justify. The restriction. So I don't know if that, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but. Yeah, I think it does. Um, I know we've run into, in fact, one of the cop watchers that is here uh, with us today uh, ran into that exact same thing where the, uh, the sheriff's deputy, uh, who we found out later is a, actually a pastor uh, at a right-wing church, but I digress. He uh, actually made her step back further while other uh, residents and, and, and citizens were much closer and walking through the scene. And then he, he actually said, I know you're, uh, you're anti-LE, so as far as I'm concerned, and he kind of stopped what he said, but he kept her back further and threatened to arrest her if she stepped forward. And he, and, and he was threatening to arrest her as other people were walking by him. Right, right. And so I wonder if his, what he was thinking is, you know, if I say they're anti-law enforcement, I can then later justify having them move farther because I think they're like a danger to me or something right. like that. Right, safety. Mm -hmm. I, you know, 
that doesn't seem like a great argument to, to me unless there is actually history of cop watchers being dangerous, which I'm, I'm not really aware, you know, yeah. of, of that sort of history. And I doubt that the individual that you're referring to has that kind of history. Um, so I don't, I, I, yeah, that seems very hard for them to justify that, that disparate treatment. Um, I think that's all the questions we have for right now. Um, if I'm wrong, uh, I got a very good uh, moderator here named Crofty. She will let us know. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, so uh, jumping back to sort of our rules of thumb here, um, avoid doing anything that could be considered interrupting. Um, and then again, comply with those orders, even if they are unreasonable. And what you should do is document them, you know? Um, I'm, you know, being asked to move to this vantage point over here. They told me to move over, you know, behind the red car from this angle. You know, you move over there, you keep recording from this angle. I can no longer see what's going on. So, you know, they've restricted my vantage point. There's no other place I can go where I can, I can film and exercise my rights. That's helpful, right? Um, you may have, you know, had your rights violated, um, but you've documented it, and that's extremely helpful. Um, moving back in one-step increments, um, just to kind of stand your ground, as long as the cops are not telling you to move to a specific place, if they say move back, sure, you know, you've complied, um, but as long as you're not a really unreasonably close distance away, that really shouldn't be, um, they really shouldn't have you move anymore. Um, all right, and so this is more, more broad. Um, if you do end up having to interact with the cops, if they engage you, what are your rights in that scenario? Um, those rights come from the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, the right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures, the right from, uh, to be free from an unlawful arrest, the right to remain silent, the right to an attorney. Um, the first thing that you should do is ask if you're free to leave. So a cop walks up to you, engages with you. Um, if you are free to leave, if they say yes, then just calmly walk away. Um, if not, then you are being detained. Um, you're not allowed to walk away at that point, and we wouldn't advise that you try to if they say no. Um, at this point, the cop will probably ask you for your ID or at least your name. Um, you can refuse to give your ID and your name. Um, there's no law in California that requires that you provide your name or identification to an officer. Um, there are, a, I think, at least one other state where that's not true. There are a couple of states, I think, where you, you do have to, so just keep that in mind. But um, there are a couple of ex exceptions even within California. If you're driving a car, you're expected to have a driver's license, and so you do need to turn that over if you're driving. Um, if you've been arrested, um, you do have to identify yourself as part of the booking process, as, as long as it's a felony like we talked about earlier. Um, and then again, if it's a misdemeanor, we still think it's probably a good idea to just give that information. Um, so, you know, I, like we already talked about this a little bit ago, the tougher question being, you know, should you um, answer that question or should you not? And those are kind of pros and cons that you'd have to weigh yourself. Um, so when the cop starts asking other questions, you do have the right to remain silent. Um, and if you are being arrested, you also have the right to an attorney. Um, so you might as well just assert them both, okay? Sometimes it's unclear whether you're being arrested or just detained. Sometimes it's unclear whether you're arrest being arrested for a misdemeanor or a felony. Um, so I would just err on the side of assuming that it's a felony, provide your name, but then remain silent. Um, and assert your right to remain silent and to an attorney. Um, a couple of pitfalls here. Um, cops say all sorts of things when they arrest folks. Um, regarding your right to an attorney, you can ask for an attorney until you're blue in the face, but they may tell you you don't have um, the right to have one right then or there's not one available. They say that a lot. That kind of indicates to people that they don't actually have the right to an attorney. Um, and that's not true. Um, what they're actually saying may be true. There's no attorney at the station. There's no attorney here right now. You'll get one later. 
That does not mean that you have to talk to them. Um, continue to assert your, your right to remain silent and your request for an attorney. Cops are allowed to lie to you as well. Okay, we see it all the time. Cops will say, it's just gonna help you a lot more if you just talk to us. We'll help you out. We'll call the judge, tell the judge that you were compliant. Things like that, okay? They can say that they have evidence against you. Somebody talked um, and they, you know, they blamed you for something. Bogus evidence that doesn't exist. So just, you know, stay steadfast. And I know that's easier said than done a lot of times. So, um, do you have to agree to a search? That kind of depends. Um, cops are allowed to do a pat down, okay? Even if they're just doing sort of like an investigatory detention, they're not arresting you, they can still do a, a pat down over the clothes. Um, they really can't do anything more than that unless they have a warrant or unless you're being arrested. If they have probable cause and they're arresting you, you can do what's called an, um, a search incident to arrest. Okay, again, it can be very unclear. These are very stressful situations. The cops obviously don't keep people very informed either about what exactly is going on. So a good rule of thumb is no matter what, um, just make sure it's clear to the cop that you're not consenting, okay? It's, we see it in court a lot. Um, the cops say, well, you know, there was silent, they were silent. They didn't, they didn't say they didn't consent. And sometimes the courts will say, well, you know, silence can be construed as consent. Um, so just make it clear, you know, even if what they're doing is legal, there's no harm in saying I don't consent to it, right? And if what they're doing is illegal, then you preserved that right pretty well, especially if you're recording at the time. Okay, at the station, continue to assert those rights. Um, and then, so how does this all play out in court? We talked a lot earlier about the life of the case, um, about how the court opinions are often um, at the motion stage. They don't really talk about what the jury is thinking, um, what the jurors think about these things. Um, we have to remember jury appeal, okay? So a lot of our advice, um, that, that it comes from a place of being, one, concerned about folks um, getting into situations that are escalated and we don't want anybody to get hurt or arrested. Um, but also in terms of jury appeal, um, if we get, you know, a video where someone is, um, you know, saying nasty things to the cops um, or engaging them before the cops engage them, um, it's much, much more likely, even if we get past that motion stage, um, we get the green light to go before a jury with our claims. If the jury watches the video and they feel like, I don't know, that person's kind of mean to the cops, you know, we have to assume that our jurors aren't going to necessarily have the same feelings as we do, as cop watchers do. Um, you're going to find that and you probably already know this, you know, San Diego is a bit um, law enforcement friendly, right? It's kind of a military town. Um, a lot of jurors, their, their brother, their dad, their cousin, their best friend might be in, in law enforcement, whether it's border patrol or a sheriff's deputy or something of that sort. And so there might be some internal biases that we really can't control um, and that they kind of can't control either. And they might not even really realize that they have them and that they harbor them. And if they end up on your jury, um, it can be difficult. Um, even if we get to that stage, it can, you know, it's, it's just not a slam dunk um, that they'll agree that the cops' restrictions were unreasonable. And so um, that's kind of, you know, our, our reasoning on these things. Um, there are times when, of course, you know, pushing the limits of the law might be a good idea, but I think in, when it comes to, to cop watching, the best thing to do is just to, to play it safe and to document and bring transparency and try to deter the police um, while staying safe. We got a reply. Thank you very much for that. Um, we uh, if opening up for questions out there for anybody that has any. Um, and in here, any questions in here? Nope. Um, 
we did get a reply from Katie Kidman. First, she said thank you, I think, uh, with a thumbs up. And uh, she said it's on appeal. Her oh, case is on okay. appeal. So we'll, uh, we'll circle back to that uh, with Katie soon. Uh, the, uh, I missed one question, and that was from uh, Mark Taylor. His was, what is the legal definition of interfering? Um, and, you know, courts have said that criminalizing that conduct does not uh, interfere with First Amendment rights. And so I think, you know, obstructing, um, delaying, resisting um, the cops is the best definition that you can really get. And then reading through those cases, cases. which I can also provide the case citations for all of those examples. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's not really like a, there's not really a definition of that aside from just these examples of where the court found there to be obstruction. Um, I think the best thing that I could sort of come up with just synthesizing the case law after having read it would be, you know, if you cause any sort of delay in what the cops are doing, um, that seems to be something that the court takes pretty seriously. Um, if there's like any delay in time. So for example, when the person ran and hit and then the cops had to spend their time looking for them, you know, that was a pretty clear example of delay. Um, resisting, you know, a physical struggle with the police would be a good example of that. Um, but yeah, obstruction, you know, I think the best example of obstruction would be telling a, a, a victim not to tell the cops what happened, right? Interfering with witness interviews, um, interfering with a potential victim, telling the cops about an abuser, that seems like obstruction. You're obstructing the investigation somehow. You're kind of inserting yourself. Yeah, I think there's a, miscon um, um, a misconception, and I, I've kind of realized it too, but uh, that uh, interfering is a physical act. Mm -hmm. um, you hear, we hear it a lot, and you know, cops kind of accept it, but they don't, mm -hmm. uh, because I guess they, you know, they have the uh, discretion uh, to and the qualified immunity to use that discretion uh, to make a bad decision, I guess, about uh, what was obstruction and what wasn't. Right. And so you're saying that it's ultimately up to the jury. Well, it's going to be first up to the court to decide. Um, Kind of acts like a gatekeeper okay and so if if a fact scenario is so 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 clear on you know one way or the other that case might um you know get thrown out or just get straight through to a jury so for example like you know if, if the court finds that no reasonable juror could possibly find in the plaintiff's favor um then it might not go to the jury at all um, or the other way around. So it's kind of, it's it's not that cut and dry, and I, I don't mean to be, you know, to get too far into the weeds, but, um, but factual disputes, generally speaking, are up to the jury to resolve, okay? So the cop says, oh, I didn't punch them, and the plaintiff says, yeah, you did. The jury's gonna decide who's credible. Um, does that answer? A little bit. They, I, they're applying a lot of the facts too, so it's you know, the jury does a lot. A lot of stuff is resolved by the by the jury. Excellent. Yeah. Do we have any more questions online? There, you guys, uh, Crofty. Did I miss any? Um, what can you do, what can a citizen or a journalist or a cop watcher do when they know or feel that they've been singled out uh, for, you know, uh, 
having to stay further away or you, when you know you've had your rights violated, but you didn't stand up for yourself so much that you got beat up, uh, what can you uh, what can you do? I think you've just got to document. Yeah. You and then complain. But when the, sure, you document and put it on the Web or document and send it in complaint or can it can can the documentation be collected into a, a lawsuit? I think it was probably what their question is going to be. Yeah, and, and I think I think it's fair. So I want to make sure keep a couple of things in mind. OK, um, one, if there's if there's one incident that occurs um, that you believe may have been a First Amendment violation or was a First Amendment violation, what you really got to do is file a tort claim. Um, make sure you preserve that right within six months. OK. If it's becoming a pattern, that may be helpful to show that you're being singled out and treated differently, um, especially if you know you have documentation video of um, you know you going to a scene and, and just standing there silently, and then you're you're treated poorly, right? Um, so document all of those things. But what you don't want to do is document for longer than six months or a year, and then you, you suddenly have waived your claims as to some of those events. Okay, so, um, you know, you can file a tort claim every single time you think your First Amendment rights have been violated, right? Um, so. What does filing a tort claim do? It, does, it, uh, does it alert anybody? So filing a tort claim, um, it, it, it's, a, it's basically a complaint, but it's outside of court, and it preserves your right to sue either the county or the city. Um, they usually have like what's called claims departments, claims management departments. And so some folks are, are alerted when that happens and they have to review those claims and decide whether they're going to um, reject them or negotiate them or ignore them. Sometimes they just get ignored. Most of the time they just get denied. Um, but the most important thing is to, put it on um, is to preserve your rights because if you miss that six month window, um, you're not gonna be able to sue in court. Um, so gathering all of that evidence is good, but you also don't want to sit on it for too long. Ex-bootlicker made a statement that uh, he'd like me to read, and I, I want to get your opinion about his statement. Okay. Uh, qualified immunity was passed to give police officers... I'm sorry, to give police officers, yes, immunity for split-second decisions. Qualified immunity was not for police officers. Sorry. This thing keeps, it refreshes. Uh, for police officers when they have plenty of time to make those decisions. So is there, is there some law? Is that some fact in there? You know, I don't think it's, it's certainly not that cut and dry. Um, but the court would definitely or should definitely take into account the amount of time that a cop has to make decision about something um, and I guess deciding whether or not that decision was reasonable but um, you know cops get qualified immunity all the time when they do things that really they had plenty of time, time for time oh yeah right it's the real question is whether the court decides that the the person's rights were clearly established in the law at the time that the event happened um, so like for our purposes we saw a lot of cases where the court um, said it was very much clearly established that someone has the right to film the police. Um, and so no qualified immunity. Okay. Uh, I think there was one more question, but I can't find it. Um, There's one right here. Okay, go ahead. What if you film the crime committed against you? A law enforcement refused to charge the individual because they knew that the person was a cop watcher. Well, that... Let's see. I mean, I don't know that that would really implicate. I don't know. That's a good. That's a good so question. So, like, the cop so is siding with the person who did the crime, basically, because the crime was done against the cop watcher. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. That was kind of a form of retaliation, right? I know. I'm trying to remember this, the elements. There's a there's a cause of action that you can bring that's. Um, basically retaliation um, based on your exercise of your First Amendment rights. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly what those elements are off the top of my head, but um, 
he would have to show that, you know, the cop retaliated because of exercise of First Amendment rights and that an ordinary person would be, um, would be chilled from exercising their First Amendment rights going forward as a result. Um, and I think, you know, potentially that factual scenario could, could add up to a cause of action in court, but I haven't researched that thoroughly. Um, I think it would be a little bit creative way um, to, to allege that kind of claim, but that is a really awful situation. Um, sorry to hear about that. Thank you very much. Um, Yes, what is it? Go ahead. Uh, Someone, a cop watcher was arrested and has been denied access to the body worn camera footage of their arrest. They're arrested but not charged. Mm -hmm. They okay. want that footage, the, the request has already been denied. Okay. Um, I'm not sure without knowing what exemption they claimed. I'm assuming they did a public records request. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty hard to get that information from a Public Records Act request. Um, usually I think they cite the investigatory exemption. Um, and I don't know, like if they weren't charged, I don't, I don't know how they necessarily justify that. But um, right. I, I don't, I'm not sure. I would have to read their response. Because I don't know if there are other subsections that I might have I think maybe the well, first First Amendment coalition might yeah, be able. Said that is what they, that's what they said. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. they, they do with it. Yeah, they uh, they get into the weeds on that particular exemption yeah. um, to the point of sending threatening letters. Yeah. yeah. But they can what they can do they can file a lawsuit. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, that's not super helpful. But if they think it's a violation of the of what's required under the Public Records Act. Excellent. Yeah. I was seeing your questions. Okay. That's good. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. And we're, you know, we're available for questions if they come up later as well. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you coming. We'll see you uh, at the next live event.